Hi, I'm Stephanie and this is my home, the 16th century Chateau de Lalande. Lalande was owned for hundreds of years by a family of marquises who were at the heart of French royal life. One of them even had the honour of being sent by King Louis XV to greet Marie Antoinette on her arrival in France. But, far from being a stuffy museum, this chateau is a living home. I live here all the time and I'm regularly joined by my mother, my family, my friends and wonderful volunteers from all over the world who help me to lovingly restore this historic home. Welcome to La Lande, a chateau filled with life, love and laughter. Hello and welcome to Sundays at the Chateau here at the Chateau de Lalande, where today I am making one of the vlogs that I've been most excited about making for a long time now, all about the beautiful fabrics of Mariano Fortuny. Now you might notice that I'm not as dressed as usual for Sundays at the Chateau. I am wearing a dressing gown, but don't worry, all will be explained later in the vlog. There is a reason why I'm wearing this. Venice is one of my favourite cities. I've been going there annually for decades now. Every year I try to find at least a weekend when I can pop in and just soak up the atmosphere of that place. And for me, one of the artists whose work best captures the enigmatic mystery and history of Venice is Mariano Fortuny. Every time I went, I would see his fabrics and gaze at them longingly, wishing that I could have some back here at Lalande, but I couldn't afford them at the time. And then I saved up and finally, about three years ago, I was able to buy two lampshades. There was a tiny little atelier down a little side alley where two women were sitting making the most gorgeous lampshades with these Fortuny fabrics. And so I went in and I ordered two because I have these lamps. I think you can see the base of one just behind me. Here's the other. And they're very flat. They're supposed to go flat against the wall. And in Venice, the fashion is for the lampshades to be half shades. So that worked really well with this style because then I could push the lamps against a wall. So I had these custom made in Fortuny's Sivigny design. And I chose Sivigny because it's based on a 17th century French design named after the Marquise de Sivigny. The Marquise de Sivigny was an avid letter writer and her correspondence from the late 17th century is considered one of the great pieces of French literature of that time and it really talks about life in these wonderful palaces and chateaus and so to me merging the genius of Fortuny, the magic of Venice, with this design named after the Marquise de Sivigny and based on a French design was this perfect merger of my two loves, Venice and France. And I thought that that would be very fitting here at the Chateau. And so since then, these lamps have had pride of place in the Grand Salon. And I thought perhaps in the future I'd be able to add the odd cushion to my Fortuny collection. But all of that changed very recently when I was contacted by Helen Higgins, an interior designer in America who watches the Chateau Diaries. And she wrote to me saying, I have some fabric that I think would be perfect for your bedroom and I know that you're looking to add to the decoration of your bedroom or change it. And I really would like you to consider this fabric. And she sent me a photo and to my amazement, it was this vintage Fortuny. It dates from about the 1940s and indeed, I could see straight away from the photo that the colours were just perfect for my bedroom. But I was amazed to discover that not only was it the perfect colour for this room, but it was also one of Fortuny's French-inspired designs. This is called Boucher, and it's named after the French artist Boucher, and you can see the French inspiration in it throughout. It just seemed too good to be true. Just an amazing find for Lalande, as though the right piece of Fortuny had found its place here in France. And what's more, she had 24 yards on an unused bolt and was offering to sell it to me at cost price. She'd bought it years and years earlier and said that because she loved the Chateau Diary, she'd be happy to let me have it at the price that she paid for it, which was extraordinarily kind of her. I realised that it was too good an opportunity to pass up on and that I would be kicking myself in the future if I didn't go for it now. And I was able to, thanks to the kind support of the patrons that we have here on the Chateau Diaries. And I told my patrons that I would be getting this fabric and I also promised that I would make two videos once it arrived. 
One is this one that you're watching now, which is about the history of Mariano Fortuny, and the other will be for me to transform it when I finally use it to make something. I will make a how-to tutorial video when I do that. To make this video, I have been losing myself in a world of research about Fortuny for weeks now and enjoying every moment reading so many books. And I will put a bibliography below this video, so if you would like to read the same books that I've been looking at about him, they're all fascinating and I truly recommend them. He was an extraordinary man and you can read about him for hours and still discover new things because he had such a breadth of interest. He was a true Renaissance man. There's always been an aura of mystery surrounding Fortuny. He was born in Granada in 1871 to Spanish parents, and on both sides of his family he came from a long line of very artistic people. His father was a famous artist in his own right, called Fortuny y Marsal, whose works are exhibited all over the world today, and you can see in his father's works a real interest in exotic motifs, and in the use of light. And that's very important because those two things would be some of the guiding forces for Fortuny in his later life and in his interests. The idea of exoticism and the importance of light. This is a painting that his father made of Fortuny's mother strolling in their garden. And you can see the extraordinary way that the light is hitting her. And you can feel yourself in the heat of that garden and in the light of that garden. And on his mother's side, Fortuny's grandfather and great-grandfather were also extremely respected artists. His grandfather was the court painter to Queen Isabella II, and here is a portrait that he made of her. Fortuny's father was an avid collector. He travelled widely and he always brought something back with him, treasures from all over the world. He collected weapons, tapestries, fabrics, ceramics, paintings. And in this photo of his art studio in Rome, you can see exactly how he surrounded himself with this wealth of treasures from all over the world. He liked to be able to see everything that inspired him around him, and that's also something that Fortuny continued to do later in his own life. Fortuny's father died suddenly at the age of only 36 when Fortuny was just three years old. And I think that that made his father even more important in his life. He kept all of the treasures that his father had amalgamated around him and close to him, and he really followed in his father's footsteps. His mother very much wanted him to continue the artistic tradition of both of their families, and so from the age of seven he had art classes. After his father's death, the family continued to move around Europe, eventually settling in Paris. But when Mariano was 18 years old, in 1889, his mother decided to move, with Mariano and his sister, to Venice. There was an unusual reason for that choice, and that's because Mariano was allergic to horses and suffered from hay fever, both of which would trigger very bad asthma in him. His mother was so worried about this, and you have to imagine, this was in the age before cars. There would have been horses absolutely everywhere in cities, except, of course, in Venice. And not only were there no horses in Venice, but there are almost no gardens in Venice. It's not a green city, it's a watery city, so it helped his hay fever enormously as well. They moved into the Palazzo Martinengo on the Grand Canal, and his mother set about transforming it into a replica of her husband's study in Rome. It was layered with tapestries and fabrics everywhere, quite an extraordinary and eclectic interior. And not only that, but his mother added to the collections because she was a great collector of fabrics. Henri de Rignier visited the Fortunis in their palazzo in Venice in 1906 and he wrote the following description of that evening. Madame Fortuny and her daughter went over to a large trunk that was standing in the corner of the hall and lifted its heavy lid. Suddenly the first piece of cloth appeared. It was a marvellous 15th century velvet, dark blue, embossed with very stylish arabesques, a velvet of a strange kind of blue, muted, deep and pure, as if it were the knight's very own mantle. One after another, they were taken out. There were heavy velvets from Venice, Genoa or the Orient, velvets that might have been worn by doges or caliphs. Then there were brocades in powerful hues, silks with subtle nuances. There were church vestments and courtly clothes. And all of this, with the rustling of invisible wings, was piled into a great heap. Madame Fortuny seemed to direct this amazing concert of textiles and fabrics that was being mysteriously performed in the depth of this old palace and the silence of the Venetian twilight. 
Just imagine, with parents like that and a childhood like that, it's no wonder that Mariano became so interested in pattern and in textile and in beauty. Surrounded by such treasures at home, the young Fortuny would spend his days in Venice having sketching lessons and going to all of the great art galleries and churches there, soaking up the work of the old masters. He was also an avid photographer in the early years of photography and would take hundreds of photos of the city. He was especially drawn to the interplay of light and dark in the alleyways and hidden corners of the city. And he often used photography before making one of his paintings. And in that, he was one of the first artists to truly use photography in that way. In 1892, he was persuaded by friends to go to Beirut to see Wagner's operas performed in Wagner's own theatre there. And that was a transformative experience for him because he fell under the spell, not only of Wagner's use of legend and his music, but his philosophy of the Gesamtkunstwerk, the idea of a total work of art, which is that all of the different artistic disciplines should merge together to become one. In the case of Wagner, of course, this was poetry, legend, acting, singing, music, costume design, set design, all coming together to create one unified work of art. This was a concept perfectly suited to Fortuny, whose interests lay everywhere, not just in painting. So he threw himself into set design, costume design, painting. And as he was doing so, he realised that the one thing truly lacking in Wagner's theatre and in all theatres at the time was lighting. The lighting in those days was very basic and to get different effects of different times of day a different backdrop had to be used each time. The same scene would have to be painted with different colours and Fortuny realised that if he could find a way of lighting the set differently he could capture many different times of day but also many different emotions. He went on to design a revolutionary system of indirect lighting and he created domes which would go in the whole back of a theatre and the dome could have different interplays of light over the back. And it was really Fortuny who invented the modern lighting booth at the back of the stalls in the theatre looking towards the stage. His lighting system even went on to be installed into great opera houses and theatres around the world including La Scala Milan. Fortuny often travelled to Paris from Venice and there he met Henriette Negrin, who was an artist's model who was already divorced, which was rather scandalous in those days. His mother did not approve at all of the liaison, and he was very close to his mother and his sister living in the same palazzo. He realised that he was going to need his own space, so he bought an apartment in the Palazzo Orfei, and he spent the rest of his life buying all of the other apartments up bit by bit, until he owned the entire palazzo, which is now the Fortuny Museum in Venice. Henriette moved from Paris to be with him in Venice, and on the day she arrived, the catastrophic event of Venice of the 20th century happened. The Campanile collapsed, and Mariano's mother always saw that as a very bad omen and really wouldn't spend any time with Henriette. So poor Mariano, who remained close to his mother and sister for the rest of his life, had to keep dividing his time. He would visit his mother but live with Henriette, whom he married several years later and who remained his muse for the rest of his life. He painted many, many portraits of her and his work on fabric was really done with her as a full partner. Once settled into the Palazzo Orfei with Henriette, he threw himself into a creative world. The Palazzo remained his refuge, his think tank for the rest of his life and he became a total artist. He did everything himself, from creating his own pigments, his own dyes, his own photographic paper, his own models for set designs, his own fabrics, of course. He was still painting, he would make his own etchings and print his own etchings. Every stage of every artistic process he kept for himself, so that he had total control over the finished result, always. As you can see in this beautiful painting, I think one of my favourites by him, he even made the frame. The scene is from Wagner and the frame has the text from the music around it. It's so beautiful. But whilst he became an accomplished painter and exhibited often in the Biennale in Venice, 
He really is remembered best for his fabrics, but as you can see, he approached the creation of them with a painter's eye. He was able to recreate seemingly ornate woven brocades filled with gold thread using only printing. It's amazing to look at these like this and then just to see how thin they are. Look at that. You can see it's just printed. It's really an extraordinary skill. The fabrics had to be pre-shrunk and then they would be dyed in successive colours to build up a richness of colour. They would then be printed and then finished by hand. And the result is that there are no two pieces of Fortuny fabric that are exactly alike. He used the same patterns, but he always used different colours. The finishes were always slightly different. He even varied the patterns themselves over the years. Here is an earlier 1920s version of the Boucher, which is both of a different scale and has some different grotesques. His fabrics all have a fascinating depth and intensity, and they change depending on the way that the light hits them. And you can stare at them for hours because you always find something new in a fabric that you've seen. Well, in my case, I have actually been looking at this like this for weeks and I see something new in it every day. I see different nuances, different colours. His fabrics are a perfect fusion of ancient design and modern functionality using what at the time was cutting edge techniques, many of which he patented himself. When you just walk past at a distance, you could imagine that you're looking at an extremely old fabric. You can see that he's gone for that look specifically in the way it looks frayed, almost like an ancient velvet. But it was never his idea to create copies or fakes. In his own words, the aim of the Société Anonyme Fortuny has never been to create a false antique. In other words, the fabrics are not imitations of the old. They are re-editions that are interpreted or translated as it were, into another language, printed instead of woven, with beautiful patterns drawing on all epochs and all genres. At times they take after fragments of precious fabrics, at times they are completely original, other times the designs are completely new and modern creations. And it's true that he drew on a wealth of sources. There are Arabian influences, French influences, of course, Venetian influences, parts taken straight from paintings of the old masters, Japanese influences, and many original designs, one based on fossils. He had an inexhaustible love of pattern. And his technique meant that whilst the fabrics look heavy and woven, they're in fact very light making them perfect for dressmaking. His dresses and fabrics were first seen publicly in 1906 when the Comtesse de Béarn asked him to design a velvet backdrop and the costumes for a production in her private theatre in France. The ballerinas wore new scarves that he had designed called Knossos scarves because at the time Arthur Evans was excavating the Knossos palace on the island of Crete and he was uncovering a lot of fragments of old Minoan art and Fortuny was fascinated by this and he took a lot of those designs and put them into these scarves, hence named Knossos scarves. They were very large, made of the lightest silk, and were meant to be worn wrapped around the body in a variety of ways, a little bit like a sari. Of course, in order to make them, he designed his own printing blocks, his own machinery, his own dyes, everything was done from scratch, and they were rather a huge success. But at the time, it was very hard for a woman to know exactly how to use the scarf. Certainly she couldn't really use it as a dress when she was already wearing a corset and a bustle and the whole shape of the scarf would have been changed by the costumes of the day. So the following year, he launched his most famous creation of all, the Delphos gown. This was a gown of finely pleated silk. The secret of how the silk is pleated is still a mystery to this day. No one knows the exact technique, which is incredible. And it was designed to be worn very simply, hanging from the shoulders, straight down, held by a very simple belt, and over either a naked body or just a silk shift. This design was so revolutionary for women at the time that it wasn't just seen as a new type of dress, it was seen as an invention and he actually patented it. In the patent document from 1909, which was filed in Paris, he wrote, the invention refers to a type of garment that is derived from the classical robe, 
but designed in such a shape and with such mechanisms as to permit easy use and comfortable adjustment. The beauty of the Delphos gown is that one size fits all. Can you imagine how strange that would have been in those days with really specific corsetry and tailoring? You could just adjust the width by adjusting little cords that were hidden underneath the dress around the neckline. But they were sold in different lengths because Fortuny said that they should really pull four to six inches longer than the height of the person. So they would pull on the floor, which can't have been that useful for walking actually, but I'm sure looked very pretty when standing stock still. He and Henriette had based its design on the tunics seen in classical statues but it caused a complete revolution in clothing. You can imagine how shocking it was in a time when people wore so many clothes and clothes that changed the shape of their body and disguised the shape of their body so much for them suddenly to be wearing something of the lightest silk over their naked bodies. Finally, women had a dress that allowed them freedom of movement and that celebrated their natural shape. They were usually worn with the Knossos scarf draped over the top or with one of the sumptuous printed velvet coats that Fortuny also created. But it's important to remember that Fortuny was an artist first and couturier second. Couturiers need to keep up with the fashion of the day. They need to keep changing their fashion so that people keep buying new things and they have to keep abreast of what's going on in society and around them. But from its release in 1907 until production stopped in the mid 20th century, the Delphos dress barely changed. Fortuny found something that he found beautiful, that was expressive of his artistry, and he stuck to it. He expressed himself through his clothes. He did not express the society around him. In those early years, his dresses were mainly worn by women whose jobs gave them a freedom and independence that other women didn't have. Dancers like Isadora Duncan and actresses like Sarah Bernhardt, women who were comfortable with being seen and comfortable with their own bodies, who didn't mind shocking people a little. Other women loved the dresses too, but because they were considered slightly scandalous, they would never have been worn out in society. They were considered to be like dressing gowns. And in fact, in France, they were often referred to as robe de chambre or dressing gown. His gowns were mainly worn either alone in the house when reading in the afternoon or possibly for tea with intimate friends. And now you can see why I'm sitting here in my dressing gown, because I wanted to give you an idea of how the Delphos dress, which really now is considered rather chic evening wear, how it was considered at first. And although it is not Fortuny fabric, it is a map of Venice, which reminds me of the city whenever I wear it. And that is something that his clothing did for the wearers. It reminded them of the exoticism and the rich history and the faded splendor of Venice. And so it, it brought this romance to everyday dressing. One writer who was particularly drawn to the evocation of Venice in Fortuny's clothes was Marcel Proust. And in his great work, A la recherche du temps perdu, or In Search of Lost Time, Fortuny is the only living artist mentioned. And he is not just mentioned. He is a leitmotif that runs through the entire work. During its creation, Proust wrote, the Fortuny leitmotif, little developed but vital, will play a role that is at once sensual, poetic, and painful. The highly sensual nature of the clothes made them perfect for the narrator's lover, Albertine. In Fortuny's fabrics, you can often see pears, especially animals in pairs. Here we have two, I think they might be lions. It's not that clear. A pair of lions with a pair of cupids. But there are often pairs of animals or birds facing each other or facing away from each other because that was a long tradition in the textiles from Luca of the past, which Fortuny was very interested in. But Proust wanted to get it exactly right before putting it into his novel. And he had seen, of course, the many pairs of birds that you can see all over the city of Venice. They're symbols of rebirth, but also of death. And he wrote to a mutual friend, Maria Hahn, to really get the facts perfectly right. He wanted to know, were there any of Fortuny's garments that had the twin birds on? And indeed there were. So he put those on Albertine's dress. In one scene he writes, I kissed her then a second time, pressing to my heart the shimmering golden azure of the Grand Canal. 
and the mating birds, symbols of death and resurrection. But the narrator then immediately asks Albertine to get undressed because he doesn't want to kiss her with those symbolic birds between us. He also asked Maria Hahn which of the old masters in particular Fortuny had been inspired by, especially if there was a specific painting. Maria asked Fortuny and got back to Proust with the answer that yes, indeed there was. One of Fortuny's robes was apparently inspired by the companion of La Calza in Carpaccio's painting The Miracle of the Relic of the Holy Cross from 1496. And you can see it here, it's the man with his back turned to us. That cape was remade by Fortuny, and Proust wrote, it was from the shoulders of a companion of La Calza that he had removed it in order to drape it over the shoulders of so many Parisian women. He was also drawn to the magical transformation of colours in Fortuny's fabrics, writing of a specific piece of velvet, that it was of an intense blue, which, as my eyes drew nearer, turned into a malleable gold, by those same transmutations which, before an advancing gondola, change into gleaming metal, the azure of the Grand Canal. I love that description. But perhaps the most important reason that Proust chose Fortuny's dresses for Albertine in his novel is that he wanted her to be in intimate apparel, in something that only her lover could see her in, something sensuous, something was, that was against the skin and revealing yet concealing at the same time. In one scene, the narrator asks Albertine if she would like to go to Versailles for the afternoon, but she says that she can't possibly go with him because she's in her Fortuny gown and can't be seen in public in it, but that would be okay as long as she doesn't get out of the car. At that point, he writes, she hesitated for a moment between two Fortuny coats with which to conceal her dressing gown. What a lucky woman. I wish that I had that problem every morning. Which of my Fortuny coats should I wear? Apparently, she chose a dark blue one and stuck a pin in her hat. But even dressed like this, in a gown, in a coat, in a hat, with a hat pin, once they were in Versailles, they debated whether or not they should pop in for tea with friends and decide that she was really too underdressed. But from those early years when polite society women couldn't be seen out and about in a Delphos gown, society caught up with Fortuny and certainly after the First World War there was a transformation in women's attire and everybody started wearing Delphos gowns. They were worn by royalty, aristocracy, Hollywood stars, everybody wanted to be seen in one and a Delphos gown even graced the cover of Vogue in 1935. After the First World War, Fortuny needed to change the way that he was doing things because until then he'd just been creating the silk dresses and velvet coats. But he realised that the raw material prices had gone up so much during the First World War and people had less money and were looking for cheaper products that he needed another outlet. So he bought a factory in Judecca, the island of Judecca in Venice, and it was an ancient convent which he turned into his factory for making printed cottons to make decorative fabrics for interior design as well as for clothing. He found cotton to be a perfectly absorbent medium with which to print his designs. He tried with various other things, with linen, with calico, but in the end he loved the results that cotton gave. He started to produce more and more and even opened a shop in Paris. And a journalist at the time wrote this about the shop. Wherever you look, you will find nothing but large overhanging lengths of cloth in warm and subtle hues, enriched with magical ornamentation. The result is bewitching. You feel as though some tale from the Arabian Nights is about to unfold against this backdrop, or a scene from Renaissance Venice. Of the fabrics, he wrote, summer cloud blues, mellow carmines and tempered reds possess that rare coloration of a carpaccio, a titian, a tintoretto or a tiepolo. And yet, thanks to the originality of their presentation, these fabrics belong at the same time to the most distinguished form of modernism. The fabrics started to become highly sought after in the world of interior design. They were used by royalty, by high society. They were in the home of Consuela Vanderbilt, Lady Marlborough, in many palaces in Madrid. And Fortuny even donated fabrics to the Church of Santa Lucia in Judeca, and they used them to decorate their columns. The director of the Carnavalier Museum in Paris, which is now the Museum of the History of Paris, 
was really turning it into a very prestigious museum and he needed sumptuous fabrics that were not too expensive and he turned to Fortuny for help. Fortuny designed the Carnavale pattern for him and that is still one of the best loved Fortuny designs, it's still in production today and he ordered in several colourways for the museum. Since then Fortuny fabrics have been used in many museums around the world including the Metropolitan Museum in New York as a backdrop for their works of art. Fortuny himself took on some interior design commissions, designing the gaming room of the Hotel Excelsior on the Lido in the 1920s. And for that room, he used his fabrics loosely hanging against the wall, which is what he did in his own palace, because he liked the way that the fabrics would ripple slightly and catch the light, so he tended not to pull them tightly stretched. Throughout his life, Fortuny continued to be fascinated with light, not only the way in which it worked against the use of dyes that he had and the fabrics, but also in light sources. And if you're lucky enough to go to Venice and see the Tintorettos in the Scuola di San Rocco today, you will see that they are lit by Fortuny's own lamps. And that is to this day. Fortuny designed the lighting and they're still using the same lighting because it casts such a beautiful indirect light onto that ceiling and lights up these glorious ceiling paintings by Tintoretto. If you're ever there, I really recommend it. If, with all of these travel restrictions, you cannot get there yet, Michael and I visited it in one of our Venice vlogs and I'll put a link to that here for you. Fortuny and Henriette quietly working at the heart of their magical palazzo in Venice, mysteriously producing things that no one knew quite how, because when they had a team of workers, each worker would only be taught his part of the process. They trained everybody up themselves from scratch, they never brought in experienced workers from other factories, and so nobody ever knew the whole picture of how things were produced. And in this mysterious way, they created products that touched people all around the globe. Women to this day love the idea of the Delphos gown, are drawn to its mystery and romance. Very few are lucky enough to have them because they're sold for about 15 to $20,000. So they're mainly in museums now. And writers and poets have repeatedly been drawn to Fortuny's work because everything he touched is infused with the romance and mystery of the past with the fabled splendours of Venice and the eroticism of soft, luscious fabrics worn directly against the body. In his novel, Maybe Yes, Maybe No, the great Italian novelist D'Annunzio wrote, she was wrapped in one of those large gauze veils that the alchemist dyer Mariano Fortuny immerses in the mysterious recesses of his vats and that is stirred with a wooden spear, now by a sylph, now by a goblin, and which he extracts coloured with strange dreams, after which, using thousands of patterns, he imprints them with new generations of stars, plants and animals. Without a doubt, to make Isabella Ingirani's shawl, he must have suffused the dye with a dainty quantity of pink, purloined by his sylph from the waxing moon. Isn't that beautiful? I often think of that quote when I stare at my own piece of Fortuny fabric and wonder what extraordinary magical dyes Fortuny used in the recess of his Venetian palazzo to make it. I feel that for the backdrop, it must have been the colour of the sylph's thigh. And perhaps this is the colour of the faded roses that she wore in her hair at the end of a night of dancing. It's a fabric that inspires poetic thoughts. As promised, I will make a tutorial video when I turn this fabric into its finished product. Originally, I had told my patrons that that was going to be bed curtains, very sumptuous bed curtains. But since it arrived, I have been looking at it in all sorts of areas of the room in different lights and just living with it and letting it soak into me and letting it speak to me and tell me how it would like to be used, how it works best with the light, which I now realise is the most important part of Fortuny's work. And I think that it doesn't work so well when it is bunched up. I don't know if you can see, but you lose quite a lot of the glory of the design. And I think, as I'm so lucky to have such a lot of it, that I will use it for a wall covering. 
and that will be in my new bedroom, which won't be this room. I'm going to be moving next door to a slightly smaller room and I'll turn this into my study. It's a fabric that's really worthy of having an entire room designed around it, rather than just being fit into an existing room. So I will design my new bedroom entirely around this fabric with exactly the same ethos that I had when I bought these lampshades, which is to fuse my two great loves of Venice and of France and to unite that in this chateau. Before I go, I also want to say that all of the photos of Venice that are in colour, the black and white ones of Bio Fortuny, all of the colour photos of Venice in this vlog were by my great friend Michael Potts, who's one of the co-owners of the Chateau de Lalande, and if you would like to see more of his work, I'll put links below to his Instagram and also to his website. The more research I've done, the more of an affinity I've felt with Fortuny, who created a magical home in the heart of Venice, filled with theatricality, creativity, love, art, poetry, blending history and modernity in a potent mix of fantasy and reality that was all his own. And that's what we're all working to do here at Lalande. I feel such a strong link with that concept that we can create the world that we want to create around us, that we can make our world more beautiful, and that we can do that with the people that we love. I'll see you next week in the Chateau Diaries and next weekend in Sundays at the Chateau. In the meantime, lots of love from Lalande. A huge thank you to all of our patrons at Lalande who are making this vlog possible, especially our Dauphin and Dauphine of Lalande, Yedel and Ether, Alice Allen, Anna, Brandon and John, Michael, Daniela, Dan Banda, Lauren Barnes, Denise Behrens, Danelle Benakovic, Linda C. Bradley, Veronica Castillo, Donna Davis, Zoe Dork, Sakura Dennis, Laura Damari, Jackie Ellison, Nicholas W. Fairfax, Tracy Ferrari, Caroline Furster, Brenda Gibbons, Abigail Grant, Brenda Harris, Delaine Holbrook, Kim Hasselhoff, Jacqueline Holmes, Helen Jacobs, Jimmy Kemp, David and Summer Lalande, Victoria Lapine, Janet Hoff Lombard, Shannon Maitland, Meredith Nina Messick, Robert Miller, Kathy Norrie, JC Award, MP, Maureen Palmer, Tamara Price, Tonya Renee, Yvonne and Peter Richards, RJB, Candy Robinson, Bettina Rojek, Hanny Ross, Barbara Schmelzer, Sven Schreiber, Lisa Schultz, Jennifer Shanks, Nancy Simmons, Patty Suhu, Susan Stevens, Jenny Stevenson, Sarah Thornton, Colleen Troyer, Brandy Walton, Coral and Ross Webb, Aaron Windish, Greg Wood, David Young and Lodovico Zordonazzo. And thank you to all of you.